In today's video, we are talking with Yak from World Socionics Society, and in this video, I'm going to be challenging Yak and Socionics about some of its core definitions and principles. Socionics is known to say that everyone should be dating their dual personality type, so their opposite. Socionics is also known to be an eight function model, and so what Socionics argues is that we have all eight cognitive functions, and in fact, we use the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth function a lot more than what we think. However, some of its core definitions sound a little bit off. Sometimes I think they make the mistake of conflating type with health or with being unhealthy. And so what I see Socionics missing is a theory of health and development. In this video, stay tuned for a discussion on whether extroverted feeling types are image or status oriented or whether there's a healthy version of extroverted feeling that goes beyond that. Oh, and whether Donald Trump is an actualized individuated person or not. Hey everyone, welcome to my podcast where we talk about flow, about personality types, and about psychology. And so today uh, we have a special guest, and that's Yak from Socionics, or World Socionics Society. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. I haven't, I haven't had the Scandinavian pronunciation of my name before, but I really appreciated it. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't do too much injustice. No, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, my my like Hebrew name is Yaakov, so that's kind of kind of used to it. But normally people don't don't say it. But yeah, refreshing. I wanted to get right into it, really, and I wanted to know uh, why why you chose to get into the World Socionic Society, and what it is, and what's so great about it. Well, I started in Myers-Briggs. So I was at school. I was 16 years old. There was Mr. Lloyd Williams. He used to do the PSHE lessons. It's like, they, they, they teach you anything in that lesson. It's not exam, examined. It's just anything, social, health, personal, anything like that. And he made us do a paper, pencil, Myers-Briggs type indicator. So I did that and I got ENTP. And I got really excited about that for a while. And I got involved in different forums, say Personality Cafe, Personality Nation. And it was on Personality Nation where I was exposed to socionics. I was, initially, I sort of looked something up online called socionics.com. I wouldn't recommend people going on there. I thought it was some sort of weird ripoff of, of Wise Briggs. Things seemed a bit strange. Some of the type descriptions were oddly physical. And they were endorsing the use of... Uh, one's face to find out what someone's type is. So I was quite put off by that quite quickly. And so I left, but um, sort of explored as some sort of weird sort of curiosity. But it was later I encountered a fellow on this forum on Personality Nation who took it quite seriously. And I thought, really, why are you taking it seriously? So I, I got involved, I got invested in, uh, in learning about it. I got invested in debating about it because I think I learn best when I'm debating. I'm a bit like, uh, I don't know, you could say a bit like Goku from Dragon Ball Z. I need to debate to get better at learning it. And eventually I get a sort of a Zenkai boost simply from being um, beaten in the debate about a subject. So I, yeah, I, 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 I learned through debating and getting into sort of online spats with people about it, which is always fun. And yeah, at some point, I think it was, I, I decided I wanted to create an, an, an offline meetup group. So I started this London Socionic Society and with, with someone else who also met on this uh, forum and had a few people come. It was cool. Eventually I went to university. I started doing a, a, a Socionic Society at my university, like a club. And then when I left university, I thought, well, why not just set up in some sort of something international on, on, um, on Facebook? So I set up the World Socionic Society. And that kind of took off, mostly because I sort of were ventured into various Myers-Briggs groups. And I was like, hey, want to learn about socionics? And people were like, oh, I don't know what that is. Could you tell me about socionomics? So they, they you know, I, I sort of managed to get a good contingent of people who were interested. And then more socionics people started to hear about it and come along and join. I had some of the bigger names, as it were, in Western socionics. Uh, eventually, uh, this fellow called Peter Bartle met up uh, with me at one of my London groups. Um, and he turns out to have been the guy who helped design Wikisocion with, um, I say design, helped write the content for Wikisocion with Rick DeLong, the guy who first translated Socionics, this Russian 
well, Russian speaking or Ukrainian speaking, Eastern European originating typology system. He's the first one sort of translated that into something which was um, English and available online for people to learn from in a sort of more open source way, not going through that socionomics.com website, which is, turns out to be quite a sort of non mainstream approach, which they just happened to seize the right um, website name, um, domain name early on. So they've got it even today. So I, I learned from essentially some of the top people. I, I, I picked up stuff. I, again, got a debating of different types, learned, got better. And over time, I thought, right, I'm going to do my own interviews online. So I did it for free to start off with because I was pretty much hopeless. But eventually I got better. And now I'd say I do a pretty good job. Um, in the meantime, I switched from my bachelor's degree, philosophy. I, switched, I, I completed that. I then went to do a master's in psychology because people kept, kept telling me, well, you know, you're trying to give us Myers-Briggs personality tests in nightclubs. Maybe you should just do psychology. So I did that. And, and drunken Myers-Briggs te type indicator testing is not a good idea. It's fun, but it's not very accurate. Um, so, yeah, I made the full transition to socionics. I decided to start out professionally in charging. Now I'm a business psychologist. And I interview uh, quite senior people going for big, senior banking or legal roles, and I do personality analysis on them. I, and I do the freelance socionics typing in, in my spare time. Right. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that you're a person that has a deep fascination with uh, Jungian typology and with figuring out the cognitive functions and the types and how they really work. And uh, uh, it sounds like that has been your primary drive and also the chance to discuss and debate with people across the world it seems to be a big motivator for you. Uh, uh, can I, uh, would, it, would I say, would you say it's... Um, a fair representation to say that you are a little bit uh, like socionics is a bit uh, uh, the Jehovah's Witness of uh, the Myers Briggs or typology community in a sense. The ones that go up and go, "Have you heard about <laughs> uh, socionics?" <laughs> yeah, definitely that. We, yeah. we are like, and and, and it's um, we are sort of like the Christians trying to convert the Jews to Christianity. Have you heard about Jesus? Have you heard about the New Testament? Right. I am, now, I'm, I'm, I'm a Jew myself, so it's sort of ironic, but it is kind of similar. Now, what I'm wondering is beyond, you know, the fascination, you know, why is it, what, what is it you think socionics can offer that uh, traditional typology like Jungian uh, typology or the traditional MBTI cannot offer? I think the key thing is the difference between valuing something and being strong at something. Mm. When it comes to Myers-Briggs, the idea is about preference. They use the example of your left hand or your right hand. They, get, they actually get people to write their signature with each hand. And the problem with the preference is not clear if it's meant to be a strength, if it's meant to be a weak point, because you know, if, it's, if it's a strength, then what happens to the other intuition? If it's introverted intuition, extroverted intuition, then you have someone like Bibi who came along and said, well, it's, it's a shadow function, and it exists in a more sort of negative space. Right. It really, he doesn't define very clearly how that what that means functionally. He came up with some sort of archetype that's mm. about how it sort of appears to you. Right. So socionics makes that clear distinction mm. that you could actually really enjoy something but not be good at it naturally and grow in it, or you could be good at something but take it for granted and sort yeah. of not use it very much or even suppress it as much as you can, which Jung actually was hinting at, I do not know, actually quite strongly saying in Jung's psychological types, but it was sort of passed over in, in focus, you know, in the transition to Myers-Briggs. Yeah. that's the most important thing. Uh, other things I would say is that it takes a lot more rigor in terms of defining each little bit that makes it up. So there right. are five different dichotomies just to tell you what extroverted intuition is, as opposed to introverted sensation. I've seen that indeed. <laughs> so uh, just to clarify it a little bit, uh, I actually, um, it sounds like uh, we're kind of on the same page here because the criticism that I've been raising against the typology community for a long time is that they are conflating type with ability. And here's what I'm arguing is type cannot be ability because ability is not completely innate. Okay, sure, there are markers, you know, genetically, you can say that you have a more likelihood of having high intelligence of being more empathetic or whatever, you can see that, but uh, type uh, uh, cognition is to a very high degree malleable and you can develop 
uh, how good you are at a certain function by engaging in it more often and practicing it. And you can learn to use any of the eight cognitive functions if you are able to consistently engage yourself in those situations and push yourself in that manner. Is that, uh, would you agree with that? No, 100%. Because in a way, first of all, you know, type is an intrapersonal thing more than an interpersonal thing. The idea of Jungian um, um, psychological asymmetry, you know, that's within you, it's not within other people. And how much you developed in that particular area, even in your stronger areas, should be limited to some extent, I think, by IQ. So right. you were to you know, compare, say, um, a very high IQ, um, I can use four letter terms like ESFP, uh, say Julius Caesar, um, people often type him as an NT in Myers-Briggs groups, but by socioeconomic standards, he'd be certainly a very intelligent sensing feeling type, politically mm. intelligent, more than strategically intelligent, he, um, tactically a genius rather than strategically a genius. Whereas you take some of, say, perhaps more average IQ, but an, an ENTP, like perhaps Prince Harry, uh, you can see you know, a, a, a clear difference there in terms of their overall capabilities and what they're achieving in the world. Right. So what, what you find is that you know, how good you are at things is, is not really useful to compare to other people. Perhaps as a rule of thumb, because most people cluster around the middle. But the point is, in, in absolute terms, your strengths in different areas are compared to your strengths in other areas, your weaker points in other areas, and how that's spanned out in a certain amount. There's also, I would say, this idea of how you develop. And this is something which a guy who I was sort of having an argument with a few, a few weeks ago, um, a guy called um, Alexander Bukolov, he came up with this idea of dimensionality to explain how the different functions vary in their strength for you. Mm -hmm. And the clear difference he made between a strong and weak is that a strong function is something you could, can, uh, can quickly pick up and apply in all sorts of new situations. Mm -hmm. Whereas when it comes to something which is weak, it builds up capability, competence in familiarity through experience, through, through practicing, essentially. Right. But, and the more you build a set of norms for how to apply it, the better you can appear at it. Mm. Then suddenly you're plunged in a situation, in other words, you're out of your depth, which is new to you. you don't, the norms no longer work for that situation. And then it comes out looking quite weak. And I think that is what enables one to descri describe how people of the same type can vary considerably in terms of their capabilities, one in terms of their raw general cognitive ability, and two in terms of what they've actually been exposed to in terms of situations and applications. Right. Yeah, for example, what I'm seeing is a lot of people today in today's world have become very civilized by how society is built. Uh, uh, there's been a big movement towards, you know, the controlling of man's like more dangerous nature in a sense. And uh, so we have institutionalized education systems and yeah, uh, we have uh, 18 years of parenting, you know, all those kind of systems set up today. Uh, and what I'm seeing is that's kind of leading people a bit away a little bit from their stronger function, uh, a little bit more towards, for example, uh, their tertiary function, which you uh, interestingly call the role function. Now, I want to go into this a little bit Ooh. more like... Uh, uh, when you say the role function, do you mean my extroverted sensation or my extroverted feeling for the NTP? extroverted feeling but actually ah, i'm that. seeing yeah. i'm seeing a little bit of both so i'm seeing uh uh the tertiary but i'm also seeing the eighth function show up a lot in autopilot so i'm seeing that those uh both of those are uh common I for entp in uh today's society because we are kind of moving towards becoming more rounded and balanced and everyone is kind of trying to be a bit more like everyone else in a sense in today's society we compare and contrast ourselves against each other's and we try to uh follow a standardized recipe for how society is and how you what you should do and how you should should grow up and in what rate you should learn yeah. so is i am that, seeing that is that in a, is that really new though? like uh we can argue about when it started uh but i can i could say that uh uh it's become more and more with the wave of uh um uh, yeah uh, industrialization and uh, uh modern uh, civilization <laughs> i see so the ability for because i think the the, the conformity nature of humanity I think that's quite inbuilt but 
the that interacting with the internet, with globalization, with interactions across groups has caused greater webs of conformity over larger spaces, larger geographies and terrains, perhaps. Mm. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Globalization has also been an influence here. Now, I want to, maybe we can go into this a bit more uh, uh, later in the discussion, but first I wanted to help people who are a little bit like stuck in the like basics. Uh, so uh, uh, how would uh, socionics define uh, first an introvert versus an extrovert? Well, that is, it's more, a lot more complicated. I want to say it's not, not actually that much more complicated. It's more abstracted than the extrovert and introvert in Myers-Briggs. Although even that, I think, is perhaps misunderstood by some people. Right. The official Myers-Briggs terms is you get energy from outside or energy from your internal world. And mm. that's sort of been taken to mean, in lay terms, socializing energy from people mm. right, as opposed to energy from spending time alone. Now, that tends to carry more socializing connotations which socionics disper dispenses with. So instead for socionics, the idea of an extrovert or an introvert comes from the placement of your functions, specifically bold and cautious functions is how readily you show that thing, how overtly you show it, as opposed right. to being a bit more subtle, you could mm. say, cautious, a bit more subtle. Mm -hmm. So the more bold, overt things, they're going to be extroverted, if you are an extrovert, they're going to be introverted if you're an introvert. Right. So what does that mean in terms of an overall abstracted behavior or thing? I, I've given this some thought myself, and I think this is a lot to do with accumulating, increasing the breadth and quantity of things mm -hmm. versus refining the depth and quality of things. And I think that can apply across for every single introverted information element we call that and that, that instead of cognitive functions yeah um, and i think that also should show up overall in a more holistic picture in the person if all their bold functions are uh, introverted or or bold functions are extroverted there should be an overall starting things up getting more things done increasing the amount of something right versus refining that down going into something in depth uh, becoming more expert in the area or just really thinking and reflecting about and then making sure it makes sense mm. to one's uh, brain or to one's soul you could right. say i think it's interesting you'd say that and i also saw that when i was reading uh, about socionics uh, so uh, i don't know if you're familiar with harry merle from cognitive personality theory uh, but he's uh, also taken introversion and extroversion in a similar direction. So what he says is that the introverted functions and an introvert are convergent and the extroverted functions are divergent. And what he's arguing then is that when we step into the extroverted functions, if we are, say, introverted, uh, what happens is we move, so we move a lot more cautiously. Like uh, when an introvert is extroverting, they are more cautious, they're more adaptable, they look more at what other people are doing yeah. and uh, whether they have permission to do so or not. And when people are using convergent functions, uh, they are a lot more confident. So this is their comfort zone. And actually, this is my personal theory uh here and uh, it's also similar so i'm seeing like three th th three different uh, perspectives here kind of come together uh, my perspective has been that uh, introversion and extroversion is about your comfort zone so mm -hmm. that means uh, extroverts are more comfortable when they are in the outer world and the introverts are more comfortable when they are in the inner world and that's where they get strength and energy to uh, then go out into the outer world uh, similarly, extroverts get strength and energy from going out to the outer world. And so what you said about breadth and depth and refining, I think is very interesting here because I have one counter argument to that and I'm curious how you see it. Uh, when an extrovert goes out and gathers a lot of concepts, perhaps you might be familiar with this if you go out and having big discussions, what ends up happening most likely is you end up with a lot of input. So you're probably a little bit overwhelmed by everything you learned from this discussion and you find yourself going inwards to analyze this. Uh, so doesn't that also give you, uh, cannot an extrovert then also possess the capacity to show refinement and oh, yeah, depth in their conclusions? This is the thing. When you're talking about things like the what we call the creative function or auxiliary, that's going to be something which is strong. It's still going to be very capable. It's just a bit more subtle. It's not going to be as obvious in the person. It's still going to be a place of, I think, still a place of comfort. 
Mm-hmm. I'm very much comforted in introvert in that particular area. But where I'm weakest at, right, I'm actually okay at my extroverted feeling and to some degree I'm extroverted sensation. Although that's not comfortable, I can still use it better. Whereas mm-hmm. if it gets down to my introverted um, functions, which are sensation and ethics as opposed to intuition and logic, that's when I'm going to have the hardest time in being able to do it. Mm. So I'll, I'll show the least of, of certain introverted things. But other introverted things, like introverted logic, introverted thinking, you could say, I'm going to be showing quite a bit of. Not as overtly, except in, I'd say, in the typology space as my mm. extroverted uh, um, ethics mm. or even my extroverted thinking is also should be showing a lot in, as right. a sort of cons- consistent background function but i'm not much of a rule creator i'm not someone who just sticks to certain structures and needs certain structures unless i'm in a particularly intellectual space right Uh, and in in a similar way you take an isfj or an infj and you've noticed this as well they're not especially in the men they're less likely to be so emotional they're more likely to actually show or, or or wear their intellect more than their than their passions and um which i think yeah. Again, it's, it's and, and this idea, which I, I don't think it's right, but what could have led to this idea of the Dom Turt loop, as it were, I think this is an example of boldness versus cautiousness. Yeah. And, and also uh, another um, dichotomy called inertness or stubbornness, which I think the idea that you push both of them, your dominant right. and your tertiary are sort of alike. One's like a wannabe version of the other. They're both trying to push and say, this is what, the, this is what I'm trying to do. This is the thing which I'm going to contribute to the world in some way and end up competing with other people over because I want to be the one to do it on my terms. Right. Okay. So you mentioned a few concepts here, like the creative function or the auxiliary function. And I want to talk about the eight function model. But first, uh, before I get into that, I want to hear uh, you, how would you define and uh, compare extroverted intuition like you see in yourself with say introverted sensing how would you define the two differences there uh, yeah so the start is first of all passing things out of sensation and intuition so first of all we know they're both perceptions they're both things which are about what is could be has been will be there's mm. no judgment there it's not an ought or a should it's just an is or potential is you could say right that's, the first, that's what i have in common now, what do they have that's different? Intuition, sensation. Intuition is internal. And what I mean by internal, that's the, that's the, the source of where it comes from. It comes internally. It's in my head. Mm-hmm. I, it, if I were to have an idea in my head of epiphany um, and ask you to draw what I have in my head of epiphany, your drawing probably won't match up to what's in my head. I can't transfer it to you directly. I have to convert it into something else, probably into words, language, shared structures or actually draw the picture and show it to you and then you can draw the same picture as converted to sensation we do it to be transferred whereas sensation that is something which is external like mm-hmm. I, I don't think many people disagree on wearing a blue shirt and I quite a crease shirt at that unfortunately because I don't I'm not very good at ironing but the the idea is you know there's a clear difference in internal and external another clear difference between intuition and sensation is how it's ex- experienced it's vivaciousness of experience. So if something's uh, physical, if something's sensation, like, uh, you know, someone, uh, I don't know, um, taps you on the head, you're going to feel that. It's going to be hard to ignore it. That's why it grabs people's attention, because mm-hmm. it is vivaciously experienced. It is felt, as it were. Whereas mm-hmm. when it comes to intuition, it's thought about. It's something which remains, um, you, you can't feel anything from it from interacting with it. It's felt as detached from you. Right. So involved and detached is another key way of taking part intuition sensation. Sensation mm-hmm. involved and external, intuition detached and internal. Then we get to um, telling apart introverted sensation as opposed to extroverted sensation and introverted intuition as opposed to extroverted intuition. So right. this is where e- extrovertedness or in- well, vertness, you could say, comes in. And this is what I was saying before about the idea of accumulating quantity versus refining in quality. I mean, that's an important thing. Another thing, another little trick which uh, sociologists throws at people is static and dynamic. Yeah. So this is about um, whether it's about flux, 
is in a continuous flow. It's more holistic and there are fewer discrete boundaries in terms of between different things making it up. It's just mm -hmm. a continuous changing thing. Or that, that's dynamic or it's static. So it's a particular thing. And if it changes, it breaks and reforms entirely. And each different point in that change is completely discrete from the other. Right. Um, and depending on whether it's extrovert or introvert, it will either be about staying very consistently that thing, or as extrovert, it's continuously switching into completely different things quite erratically. So you take those two di different concepts. And so you get an idea of intuition, an abstract thing, that is, as you say, very much divergent. It's about seeing different possibilities, different places of potential and trying to accumulate as many of them as possible in that space of what is potential. So not here. Anything to do with intuition is not here. So a fear of commitment is a very clear example of someone who's extrovert intuition oriented because they don't want to feel limited by selecting and limiting the number of possibilities that are available to them. They want to keep it all open. They want to keep an open mind to new ideas. What if they're wrong? They want to keep open to that possibility they might be wrong. They'll entertain things uh, which I'll say there's no point in entertaining. It's never going to work. Well, I want to try. I want to see what happens. It's probably going to be a bad idea. I know, but I want to see if it's a bad idea. It might be a good idea. It might be a surprise. So someone who's very inclined to extra extra intuition gives things a chance a lot more and are almost very stubborn about giving it a chance. I will give it a chance, God damn it. Whereas you get to um, introverted sensation, right? This is going to be dynamic. It's going to be introverted. So refining um, something which is quite in con continuous flux, refining the flow, refining the flow of the sensation in the moment, the experience of the moment. What you describe, I think, as flow is pretty much how I was thinking of introverted sensation, this idea of flow, this harmonization of the sensory experience as a, as a whole, as, as holistic. And there's no clear thing picked out from anything else that is, feels natural, organic, wholesome, that sort of experience in the day-to-day. -day. And the idea, of the reason these two, because it's being so someone talks about duality, the idea of things from different parts indirectly complementing one another, introvert sensation, extrovert intuition, they share in this tendency, which I call world acceptingness, it used to be called judiciousness in the, in the sort of official terminology, but I think world acceptance perhaps works better to describe this idea of being curious about the world, see, just turning things over, exploring all the possibilities it has to offer. But then the other side of actually savoring that, just sitting down and experiencing it, smelling the roses for what it is. Mm -hmm. These two attitudes complement each other. They don't directly conflict. They don't confront one another. Sure. Um, whereas if you take, say, introvert sensation, introvert intuition, they're almost mutually exclusive. You, mm -hmm. uh, the way the social system works is you can't have one and the other together. The more you go towards one, the less you're doing the other. Right. Um, whereas it's not quite the same for, say, SI and SE. They sort of can exist side by side, just that you're focusing on one more than the other. One has undertones of the other, perhaps. Um, right. So, yeah. Uh, so I actually want to argue a little bit on that. Like, first of all, I want to say uh, thanks for looking into the flow concept and for taking an interest in studying that. Uh, I think it's really a uh, uh, cool thing to look at. Oh, but before I want to get into that, I want to ask and clarify uh, first, because uh, you uh, uh, like socionics is said to be about information metabolism. Uh, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm uh, seeing and how I interpret that is it's a little bit Maslowian, right? So it's kind of looking at, you know, like mm -hmm. what people need. So uh, essentially each cognitive function is a need, you know, for a certain thing. Uh, and uh, you could almost like put it up like that and say, okay, extra intuition is the need for ideas mm -hmm. or so on. And uh, now I'm dumbing it down very Absolutely. much, but yeah. uh, uh, motivation. Yeah. Yeah, so here's uh, my argument, and that is, uh, first, I'm on board with this. I, I do see that uh, um, every type has different needs and different values uh, and preferences in things of what they want. Uh, what I'm saying is, is that when a type goes into a uh, function and gets that need met, uh, what happens is they are given a positive emotional reward. So uh, for example, uh, you become, if you do and engage in your extroverted functions, you become more comfortable, for example. And if you engage more in your introverted functions at the expense of your extroverted functions, you become more 
anxious or more uncomfortable, for example. Uh, and similarly, if you engage in your intuition, you get more energy. Um, now, if you engage in your sensory uh, at the expense of your intuition, uh, now you can do both and it can be combined, but if you engage in it at the expense of, so uh, instead of pursuing your intuition, as best, instead of doing something you enjoy or having the intellectual debates that you want, you know, uh, and purely engage in the sensory, the, you're going to lose energy. Best basically, it's gonna, you're going to be less en energized. You're going to feel less interested. You're going to have less like attention to what the other person is saying uh, or what is going on. Uh, so what my argument of flow is, is that, when you are able to meet your needs as your type, you get the positive state that is basically the flow state that is like you're comfortable, you're confident, you're energized, you're motivated because you're doing and engaging in uh, the core processes that uh, are your core dominant needs in life, essentially. So it's not just for, uh, for introverted sensing in a sense. Um, it's not just meant to reference a state for one type or for the ISTJ or ISFJ but it's meant to be a type that can combine many different kinds of flow. So of course the ENTP flow might be different <laughs> from the ISFJ flow or the INFJ flow or so on. Uh, but uh, flow is meant to be a broader concept, an umbrella term to capture all kinds of different styles of energy and motivation. But, but what's interesting, we used words such as comfort and anxiety. Yeah. Because that's it, it's already seeing a very complex thing. It is a complex thing. Yeah. But through also a lens which suggests more introverted sensation. Because some types, if I, for instance, there's this, there's this idea in socionics that, you know, the, the good relationships are more harmonious. But that doesn't look harmonious. If you were to put two beta types together or two gamma types, they wouldn't look so harmonious. They'll be, they'll, um, especially betas, they need to have their regular fight, they need to have an intense clash of wills and passions for them to feel that is a worthwhile relationship. And so it, 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 it's such a fundamental level that if you ask a different type to describe the thing, which we just defined as good or positive or flow, comfortable, meaningful, they will gravitate towards different ways of thinking about it. What, Definitely. Yeah, so what, what, what we call comfortable, they may actually think as being, oh, that's mundane, that's actually not meaningful. And so it become it, it's difficult for any of us to just come up with a word to describe this this very complex multifaceted thing that is I don't know goodness for the person you could say actually yeah. like the words that they use to describe it are actually kind of similar but how they connote how they attach it and what activities they attach it to is very different that's also why we can take away such different experiences from a conflict for example like for example i definitely don't enjoy conflict uh but uh what i can see is that when uh, uh, certain types engage in conflict uh, they definitely feel comfortable in that situation and they don't even perceive it as a conflict. They yeah. perceive it as just that fun disagreement. And yeah. uh, while you might go, oh, uh, sorry if I upset you, they're like, what, upset me? <laughs> what are yeah. you talking about? Because for them, that, that was comfortable. That was easy. That was natural. You know, like for them, uh, it took no energy and uh, maybe they even left feeling better than what they felt like before it happened, you know? So um, that's it, you know, for them, it's still comfort. And I think everyone definitely needs comfort, but the strategies that we pursue to achieve comfort those can vary and definitely, okay, I want to contradict myself here. Uh, there are certainly people that don't uh, pursue comfort, um, especially people that have a growth mindset or a challenge mindset. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah. it's not necessarily so that everyone wants to or is uh, ready to experience flow or to uh, like in that state because yeah, there can be different reasons. They can be in a state of autopilot. They can be stuck like, and they don't know how to literally get out of it. And even if they know what would they should do, they don't, they can't muster the energy or interest or motivation to do so, or they, they just don't feel in control. Uh, so they're waiting yeah. for somebody else to help them into it. Uh, or they are like so stuck in that growth challenge mindset that they are like they, they don't believe that they deserve <laughs> flow. Right. Uh, like they have that, you know, I have to whip myself, you know, I have to constantly work, I have to constantly do things and I have to constantly bring yeah. value to society. And, you know, like yeah. uh, even if they're anxious to the max and like uh, uh, completely broken from it, they keep pushing themselves, you know. So not everyone does 
yeah always pursue flow i i was i was talking to someone who was like this just today i was doing a, fee a feedback session for a guy i i i um, was pretty sure he was an e entj in the sociologist right and for him that it, the reason i i saw it was very clear as him being that type was about his blind spot to me was very clear but that was he was a person entirely without any pursuit of flow for him he was constantly going 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 making things more and more intense he was going to work himself into burnout essentially he knew he was going to work himself into burnout because people were sort of dropping him hints already yeah. and people were finding a bit quite, quite intense yeah. in the uh, in the workplace environment so what i was sort of suggesting is you've got to take these hints you've got to um start to accept but actually yes i'm not going to tell you to embrace the way of flow you could say i'm not going to tell you to embrace um you know because in a way the flow for him is not to be in flow the yeah. flow for him is to be constantly working and constantly trying to improve and and never really be resting in terms of what he's trying to achieve but also be quite impatient and quite intense in that respect and never really rest right. but for him what what was the closest thing to flow for him was something which could get him to switch off that sense of constantly keeping the mind racing and move more towards a do or die, a fight or flight situation. Mm. So that, and that focused um, highly intense sensory experience, which he found through, um, you know, motorbikes or other people that's mountaineering or something really yeah. intense, which gets them into a sense of focus in the here and now, because I wasn't, he wasn't going to be someone who's going to be sunbathing anytime soon. Like that would be health. Yeah, I wouldn't but, recommend it. <laughs> no, no, exactly. So, but yeah, and that he he seemed to find that quite helpful. But, yeah, um, put some other things as well. But it was that that was helpful to him. So it, it's this. I, I don't know. I think I, I wonder about the idea of flow, the idea of growth mindset, and if is the is the um, ambition for you to apply that uniformly towards all the types, but then change what flow means. And growth and, and growth mindset means for each of those types. Yeah, uh, like when I say flow, for example, for the sake of an ENTJ in this example, yeah. I definitely think that flow includes being productive and having an appropriate set of challenges every day and uh, uh, being able to uh, set goals and to set targets and meet targets, you know, and to challenge yourself on that level because that's what gets them into a state of flow and that's something they enjoy and why shouldn't they do that? So um, I... The flow state for the ENTJ in that way is very different from that of an ISFP or an INFP <laughs> in that sense. Uh, so what I'm seeing is uh, uh, that uh, certainly like uh, the problem an ENTJ can face is uh, uh, either from the sake of the tertiary function or from the sake of the inferior function. And uh, it can be the persona, uh, you know, the idea that you have to present a certain image of success uh, and constantly being successful and everything constantly working out. Um, and uh, appearing in a certain way to everyone else, uh, when in reality, as an ENTJ, you're probably a bit of a gambler, you know, you're probably taking risks, you're trying new things, you're uh, sometimes right. exploring hints that are not going to pan out, yeah. and you're not always doing well. And that, I think, is very taxing for an ENTJ, for example. So there's, there's, uh, like, yeah. it's confronting those kind of parts, you know, that will help an ENTJ into flow. Uh, so breaking the <laughs> problems with introverted feeling and extroverted sensing. Because I think, it, it's as if we, we have an understanding of a type on the surface that's quite similar. But as we dive in, we start to have very quite different interpretations of the type under the hood, as it were. Hmm. So, for instance, the idea of the ENTJ is, I mean, where, where I think the ENTJ can be caught up in image, I think that can be a sort of more negative spin. I agree with that, but that's for a different reason. Because I think that's what I, what I would call the role function. And the role function is the opposite in nature to your leading function, your dominant function. So FE for an extroverted thinking type. And so for an ENTJ, it's not that they actually are really so interested in how they come across to others. That doesn't right. really float their boat. Rather, they see that as a place in which there is risk, that if they do something which ruins their reputation, they won't be able to pursue the thing which does matter to them, which is their personal achievement. And the idea that the person who is not really for anyone else is for them. It's I achieved this. I worked hard through my grit, through my determination, and I made this thing. And yeah. no one could have stopped me from doing that. And 
as a general motivation, I think, for these types, NTJs, SFPs, which is that they want to be able to preserve their independence and their autonomy, yeah. to not have anyone else be the boss of them. I see that. Right. Yeah. And so FE becomes a place of risk. Oh, I have to manage my, my reputation. Otherwise, someone could try and take away the things I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. Someone could try to power against me. Mm-hmm. Which literally, you look at, say, a type like Jeff Bezos. He has a, I think he's an ENTJ. He has a very conservative way of approaching social media. For him, it's like, it will be bland, naff stuff. He'll put up there, not because he's interested in it, because he knows that's how he gets, you know, the uh, the, the hellhounds off his trail in yeah. terms of um, not being, you know, being a person who would be likable to the masses. The he's opposite not- of Elon Musk's strategy. <laughs> exactly. The opposite. Because Elon Musk actually cares about this. He wants to push the envelope in how people are going to feel and respond to him. Mm-hmm. He wants to be have an authentic part of himself accepted. But yeah. in that, he knows he's playing at the risk in terms of presenting parts that may not be accepted, may backfire horribly. Yeah. But that's meaningful to him, being on the edge of risk um, in terms, it's a high stakes, high reward zone, that extroverted feeling space. Um, so it's not, it's not just risk management like it is for Bezos. Right, right. Uh, so uh, I actually want to clarify that when I say image, I don't mean extroverted sensing as image. I mean uh, that the tertiary and fourth functions are often motivated by image. So one argument that I'm making is that the first okay. and the second function are intrinsically motivating, and the third and the fourth are motivating for the sake of other people. And uh, that means it can be a bit more image conscious. Uh, a lot of time uh, we pursue the third and fourth function out of a sense of should, uh, or like because other people want this from me or need this from me, I will do this. Uh, while the first and second function uh, you do, even if other people tell you not to do it, right. you still do it. So yeah. because it gives you personal gratification. Um, well, it, it, it would have to basically, for this to make sense in my structure, it would, it, I'd have to define the things making them up completely differently. Mm-hmm. Um, where I think of what you described, that what's, what makes sense to me as being what we call the super ego block, as opposed right. to like Freud's super ego, you know, the sort of, yeah. oh, you should be doing this, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. But I, whereas yeah. we would have put um, those two functions, um, the tertiary and inferior, we would have put them or their, their equivalents in what we call the super id block, which is meant to be about our needs and aspirations. So it's turned into a positive space, but a space of some vulnerability and and growth and development, a mm-hmm. bit like a baby or a teenager. Right. Whereas the things where, no, this is what's expected of you, what you're forced to do, that then comes from um, what we call the role and vulnerable. So right. for let, let's take uh, an ENTP, for example. If it, and, and of course, we're working on slightly different definitions or quite different definitions of SI and FV. But for an ENTP, I would imagine that, well, I'd, I would say that extroverted feeling and introverted sensing forms this almost desire to be in positive emotional spaces, to have positive reception for their, for their idea, which they're offering, to be in flow and harmony in the moment with other people, to essentially be part of some sort of community, sense of other people in which they are valued for their uniqueness, while also being included and accepted within that. I think INTPs are quite similar for them, more emphasis on being included by others rather than actually achieving that flow, which is what they want to do for themselves. And the ENTP more about being someone who can make people accept them because they are, they have charm, they've proven themselves to be charming, as it were, and people then help create that harmonious space for them, around them, they outsource it. But whereas the things which at least for me, I'd say are more pressure put on me from outside, and that comes from, first of all, the need to be um, powerful, the need to acquire resources, the need to work um, hard through willpower on things which aren't necessarily interesting to me. Um, and these things would be coming through from the expectations of society, from extra of the sensation. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily image and socionics. It may be more to do with status in terms of earning more than the people next to me. I want to be earning more than the people who come around to me for dinner because you know I want to be better than them because an expectation of me to be better and competing to get further, which would be classed as extroverted sensation in the socionic system. Right. And another thing, introverted 
feeling and socioeconomics. This is going to be that personal assessment, personal judgment of character. Mm-hmm. So, and if you if you mix FI and SE together, at least something which has always been totally alien to me, which is harsh judgment. The idea I can have a personal judgment of you as a person and not like you and want to create a boundary between me and you based on my personal attitude towards you. It, uh, it doesn't even consider enter into my mind, but it's something which is there. And I remember experiences when I was younger when people would become quite personally moralizing and judgmental towards me. And that was like, what is this thing? I don't get it. I don't really appreciate it. Um, and what I realized that it's not that I felt pain in this area, though. I did feel pain in the um in the inferior function because that created a negative unpleasant social environment which is the thing i really craved um so it, it it's i know we we, we take we, we put more concepts into the box which allows us to spread things out into different areas and thereby de- define and make sense of it whereas i think when it comes to more of a four function model thinking about mixing to get for instance what happens then to the positive growth in the areas you're not good at when you have a system where these areas are also seen as negatively put upon you? Right. Yeah. So uh, that's actually yeah what I want to do discuss next as well, uh, because um, I used to say, I, I must say my opinion on the flow state has matured a lot over the years, so five years since I've been working with it. Uh, and I used to work with the idea that the first and second function uh, were the ones you should constantly strive to have and muster and possess and uh, develop. Uh, and I find that that is good advice for most people today, uh, because most people today are still in the struggle of finding who they are and, re- and validating themselves and giving themselves permission to be themselves, you know. Uh, like most people, that's why people study the MBTI today. I would argue that most people that come into the MBTI today, they're looking to find out who they are and they're looking to find out what their passion is. So I tend to say it's generally good advice. But what I'm finding is once you have gained that self-acceptance, once you have started to understand who you are and you are allowing yourself to be yourself and you've gotten rid of unnecessary shoulds and musts and stop acting purely for image or status or uh, what you would call it, um, then uh, that's what that's when you start developing uh, genuine uh, compassion. Uh, so you move from that stage of being individuated to transcending the self. So you go from just being motivated by the self and your own needs and what's good for you uh, to also uh, incorporating and understanding how you can help the world and what you can do for other people. And that's when you start like moving from, you know, just having possession of the first or the second function to starting to have possession of uh, even the third and the fourth function. So I'm curious, what is your thought on cognitive function development and how do you see the functions developing in a person? Um, Yeah, I I think I'm a strong advocate for cognitive function development. I wonder about, it it comes back to the idea of flow and the idea of anxiety and the idea of, you know, what are the things which are negative and to be avoided and are those negative things for us, positive things for other people? So we're talking about status. We're talking about, about image, as it were. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, when I look at someone like uh, at least a socionics understanding of an ENFJ, because it's, I think the ENFJ every time is always quite very, very goody goody, and it's hard to sort of pick out, you know, what their what their turnoffs are as much as different from the ESFJ. But when it comes to a socionics ENFJ, yeah, they certainly care to, about the aesthetics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when it comes to a socionics ENFJ, this idea of pursuing status and meaning and significance in the world to be someone who, yes. I am the one who has inspired others. I am the one who who stood on the pulpit, as it were, and been able to actually manifest this meaningful change in hundreds of thousands of other people. That is a that that would be a you know definitely image and status based. Um, In socials, we think state that formal status in society comes from extroverted sensation and introverted thinking. The idea of hierarchies: where am I in the hierarchy? And then extroverted feeling, introverted intuition this idea of an image which is sustained over time my brand um and so when it comes to these types we call them beta types stps and nfjs in a loose translation across i'd say yeah go for image go for all those things which for me are gonna not be um 
not, not be as as fun. I mean, to be fair, I do like to be known. I do like recognition in a sort of positive, non statusy way, better than you sort of thing. Um, mm. But when it comes to the beta, they, they, they'd be all for it. They want to climb to the top of the hierarchy, um, assuming they identify with that particular hierarchy. They may instead decide, no, I'm going to find my own tribe, my own group, which is away from this banal um, sophistry, you could say, or they just don't believe in that particular structure. They'll find something else. There's lots of room for variation in this. Right. Well. So I have a test that I think we should be able to run uh, to determine if that's true. So uh, if it's the case that ENFJs are oriented purely by image uh, or extorted feeling types are more image conscious uh, in a sense, uh, then it would uh, suppose that uh, an ENFJ uh, would not uh, okay, so this is my argument. An ENFJ would be able to sacrifice themselves uh, and their image for the sake of uh, doing uh, something that they think is right for the tribe and for other people. So uh, even if an ENFJ went down hated for it, I think an ENFJ would still uh, be prepared to do something um, they thought was a good thing for the tribe uh, that they thought would help others, that they thought uh, would in end create positive consequences that would be positive for society. I, I struggle to think of, an, of a very good example. Because mm. uh, ENFJ, I mean, I look at ENFJ, um, well, a, a good example of someone who is so carried away by the image more than even the reality, which I think yeah. is a definitive problem of because they often, they often can lose the sense of themselves in the image they create. They become the mask they would have put on. Um, yeah. They want that mask to be validated by the society they're projecting to. I'd it, argue that um, the, I would argue that they don't want it to be validated by other people, but I think they do want it to be genuinely beautiful and they want it to be genuinely good. Like they want it to be a cool story. Uh, I think the company? story, I think the story itself is the core motivator for the ENFJ. And so uh, what they are passionate about is that, you know, of, uh, being a cool character, having integrity, you know, being the knight that, you know, does the good thing, uh, thing or being uh, that uh, inspired person or role model and that's not because yeah. anybody else says oh you're such so inspiring you know if you could tell an ENFJ that they'll be like yeah sure <laughs> you know uh, but how, they how are doing you, it for themselves I but think. how can you be inspiring if there's no one to inspire I mean that's the complicated thing right uh, but I think the ENFJ uh, and I think this is a critical thing that a lot of okay say INFPs will often criticize the ENFJs for this and that is that ENFJs do what they think is uh, the good thing for everyone else, but not what is actually the good thing for everyone else. And uh, in that sense, you know, the ENFJ will do what they think is, you know, uh, something that is positive and good for the world. And I will set a good example, even if uh, it's never been asked of them, or even if it's something that uh, uh, other people will not appreciate, or like, uh, it's not necessarily checked in with the tribe. I'm just trying to think, but, but what, 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 what does a sense of what is good or, or, or bad come from? It could come from not necessarily feeling, it could come from thinking. I feel like from... we're having a nihilist discussion here. <laughs> no, 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 but, but I'm saying, because okay. Where does good and bad come from? <laughs> no, no, but, but this is the point. Down deeper. Depending on your cognitive functions, you can derive good and bad from different things. Yeah. So a frequent thing I've noticed in a type, which I think is an ENFJ, is that they get so caught up in trying to create the effect in other people that they lose a sense of what their principles even were, or even appear to not have many principles. Yeah. Um, and um, and, that, and um, it takes a type of, uh, of introverted thinking to essentially ground them in what the principles are, what their ideology is, how they should approach this world, and how and what what are the inspiring people um, in terms of a set of clear beliefs. And they can get caught up in just this sort of well, well, feel meaningful feeling imagery um mm. and and a very clear example a, a clear example of this phenomenon taken to its extreme i think is in the elizabeth holmes case where you have someone who essentially pretended that they had the technology to do these very advanced blood tests but was so caught up this is a, a young woman starting out dropped out of um from the stanford and embarked on the Speranos project and got so caught up in the image she was creating for herself. She starred herself after Steve Jobs, uh, had the same black polar neck. She deliberately made her voice deeper to sound more convincing and got caught up with these celebrities and important politicians and powerful people 
consorting and interacting with her based on this image she'd having to spin about her sitting at the helm this very powerful new technology where the technology wasn't actually there and eventually it all fall ap fell apart and right, this right. idea became th th this image she was trying to um portray to other people i see it as an extreme example it's got none of the supporting things everything else is taken away it's just the image which is why it's unsustainable we take someone like steve jobs the other hand i think it's the same type some people may call him a thinker and socialites we allow these sort of tougher um tougher feeling types there uh, they don't have to be very nice but uh steve jobs who also was the evangelist of technology was the real deal unlike mm. elizabeth holmes in what he was doing but the same this idea that without the people to um react to what they would hope is the authentic self-expression they don't necessarily get a sense of what they're doing is actually right as it were and i've seen other enfjs when they felt Mis uh, they felt that an injustice has been happened has happened against them based on some introverted thinking. The immediately they do is they appeal to others. Say, Isn't this unfair? Isn't this awful? Isn't this terrible? And end up en enlisting the support of other people to um, to respond in the way which they expected to their rant, to their um, to their emotional expression. So I think if if it, if they had an internalized confidence in what they thought was right it wouldn't make sense for them to go and seek out how people are going to react to it. But if we look at an opposite example, say an INFP, I'd say INFP is very much their personal subject evaluations, and they don't, they're not looking for how people are going to react to that. Where they are looking externally, it's more in terms of their competence and capability, more of extroverted thinking. I think yeah, we're talking does. about two kinds of uh, ENFJs here, and I do see a big difference. And I'm curious in the comments, yeah. if you uh, are an ENFJ or uh, ESFJ maybe, and you have personal opinions of this, feel free to let me know what you think about it. What I'm seeing is, uh, you know, there's certainly the kind of ENFJ that you talk about that is more immature, like more concerned with getting approval, uh, more concerned with image. But I'm certainly also seeing that there are ENFJs out there that are well developed. And what I'm seeing with them is that they know that their, their extroverted feeling is an intrinsic rather than external motivator. So uh, that means, uh, yeah. if you take, for example, a person like the greatest showman, Hugh Jackman, for example, like what you see there is a person that is able to take, you know, a group of misfits, put them together and exactly. create uh create uh, a show and to uh like in a sense uh go out and try to prove uh, the critics wrong even if I, he knows and he's frustrated with the fact that everyone disagrees yeah. with him and thinks it's a terrible thing you know like to put it through uh so i mm -hmm. see as well that the uh, extroverted feeling can also take that role and can be uh, yeah. of knowing okay the people will get it in the end you know the people will understand this is the right thing mm -hmm. uh and the concept of the people i think is yeah. internally derived, even if it's extroverted feeling the concept of the people and what they want and where it comes from you know and how you want to be what kind of a person you want to be to the people i think that's internally derived. so not uh, necessarily what everyone else tells you they want but what you think is for the best for the people well, i i wonder about the idea that this is seen as well developed less developed i think when it comes to mo a lot of the nfjs i speak to a lot of them even say, "What you know? What even is good and bad?" They don't even believe in that sort of thing. They they, they see it more in terms of you know, it, it's not meaningful to them to even think in those terms. And a lot of I people think, struggle with that. Yeah, but but the, the point is that they that they see what they're doing to be someone who's significant and recognised. That is meaningful. That is their development. That's their growth. Mm. Um, but I'd say um, when it comes to P.T. Barnum, um, he's, the greatest show. I think he's more of a sort of a a composite character of first of all the real P.T. Barnum who's a far more cynical overtly yeah. cynical very him. different guy I know <laughs> yes I would have typed him as a socionics version of the ESFP be a gamma definitely yeah. a gamma yeah uh, I, I, I'm talking here about the Hugh Jackman uh, style yeah. <laughs> kind he just of sort of takes some of the facts of P.T. Barnum the sort of yeah. the opportunistic um, you know how can I make a buck here approach yeah. And then overlay the sort of very sort of feel good ESFJ ness, which um, I say Hugh Jackman would be an ESFJ. It's very much yeah. the positive, feel good. It's Same. nice on the surface. It's not meant to get too deep in terms of 
you know, right. what is really meaningful. It's just a nice message of inclusivity and positive cheer. I mean, I like this. <laughs> well, uh, I feel like we've taken this discussion quite far. Okay. So I want to uh, just uh, start uh, wrapping it up a little bit. But I do uh, want to uh, uh, round back a little bit to... Uh, uh, cognitive function development. And so I'm curious, just in general, uh, how um, like do you see cognitive function development working? What is your, what is socionics model for like cognitive function development? How should we develop the functions? How, how does that look? So the idea is it, it, to make it very as simple as possible. It's to move from the low stakes, low reward of the demonstrative function, which would be, let's say, uh, let's take an ENTJ, mm. right? That would be extroverse intuition, that sort of speculative, worrying about different possibilities space, right? Open to new opportunities, able to see the positive opportunities as well as negative, but essentially speculating rather than act acting and doing something which is actually quite assertive and concrete in terms of achievement. Mm. And moving from that low stakes, low reward to the high stakes, high reward of the mobilizing function, which is basically like the, the tertiary function. Mm. So, and we can see this in... We can see this in uh, someone like, um, and a good example um, is, is that's um, the last, the most recent, the previous um, American president, Donald Trump, who I think in many ways has actually grown and developed in terms of his mobilizing function. So he started out as the businessman. He started out as the person you talk and see interviews with him in the 80s. So it's very much focused on facts, how to do things in terms of the property space. He was actually relatively dry in terms of his communication. And over time, he became more grandiose. He became more about how am I coming across to others? What is the image that I uh, can be uh, received as? He started as stamp, um, stamping his name on things. And eventually, you know, the participation in the democratic process is perhaps one of the ultimate forms of extroverted feeling validation. To have people vote that they like you the most, to put you at the top of the hierarchy of the American system. Um, if, you, if you look at it in those terms and look at it in their own terms, not in terms of our own judgments, that is um, that, that would have been, you know, um, the self-actualization, except that it was sort of went horribly wrong in the, in the next election when he didn't win. And now he became quite very bitter about it and all the rest. But, and he reacted very badly to having that uh, positive feel of actually being the president taken away not very he was given a very easy time throughout there's lots of negative extroverted feeling attacks going throughout his presence so but what do i mean is that you can see this growth from pragmatic pragmatic logical how things work thinking towards emotional i'm going to um get people um riled up i'm going to get an emotional reaction of people um thinking this is a yeah. feeling um, honestly, I think it's a very controversial pick to put Donald Trump as uh, the height of cognitive function development ah, as a positive I, example. I, I like I'm, curi I'm curious uh, how the comments are going to be about that. Uh, what I do want to say is I actually do agree with you to some extent that I do think that he was uh, in flow uh, or he was at least fairly um, strong in his dominant function and fairly uh, developed in terms of his intuition, uh, no matter what I think about him politically. Um, and you can see that because of his natural authoritativeness and uh, like his convincing uh, pull and how he is able to affect other people. What I see with people that are like more in a dominant state is that they are uh, better at rallying people around them, but they're also they're better at polarizing people. You see that with Jordan Peterson as well. You know that uh, the the strength in the dominant function tends to have uh, uh, it tends to be a double edged sword. Uh, because yeah, of course, the more you push for yourself, the more you're free that you are in expressing yourself. Yeah, the more criticism you're gonna get. Um, so yeah, that also goes, you know, like uh, uh, to uh, perhaps uh, the final question to wrap up this discussion in a sense, because ultimately, a good and bad is gonna be different, different personality types. So how do we bridge that? If different types have different values, and some of those values can be, as you brought up, uh, in conflict with each other at times, yeah. uh, how do we create a society where everyone has and is allowed to engage in their dominant states and the, to uh, express and reach their height of energy and motivation and the confidence? Uh, while uh, giving everyone else the same permission <laughs> to do the same thing and to have different values and to do approach things differently. Well, this is something which 
leads to conflict. It leads to clashes of different better mentalities and personalities. Saying that, it's not always a very clear conflict. Often there's more conflict-oriented types who get into conflict over it. But what I would what I would say is the positiveness in it is that often dialectics exist where a very different set of values tend to run things, as it were, in a society. And, and the, the, almost the opposite tends to sort of exist in the cracks and actually be able to bloom and prosper. Mm. So a good example, um, say, um, the Merchant Republic of, in Venice, um, the very sort of what I'd say more sort of gamma NT approach, T-E-N-I, very sort of pragmatic, uh, very much about personal wealth and um, acquisition of, of one's own um, achievements. But within that space, you had people who can be very sort of innovative and almost funded to be quite innovative and just to explore new ideas and actually bash ideas together and create new stuff in the more sort of any TI alpha NT space. And I think you, you can get that even with, um, in the same more beta space, more sort of highly politicized, very sort of um, even quite, quite authoritarian as a, as a society. That in local communities under that overt authoritarian state, you have local communities of people just engaging their own personal development and growth can still happen. Um, so I think there's there's lots of room in these sorts of different clashes of, of different uh, values, as long as they're not necessarily sharing a flat with one another, where they can, I think, find the areas and circles in which they can grow and develop and be themselves, pursue the things which are in line with their values. Um, yeah. I'd like to offer a contrasting perspective there and say that uh, I think if you are well developed, I think it's easier to deal with people who are different than you because there is less insecurity uh, and fragility in there. Because I think often the problem that we get to today is uh, uh, that uh, people who are less developed uh, can struggle with uh, yeah, all kinds of anxiety or envy or jealousy or stress or uh, other negative feelings that uh, lead to uh, significant clashes and I think also conflict in a sense. So the fact that not everyone is in flow or <laughs> not everyone is doing great, I think is also one of the biggest reasons why we have conflict. I have a question. Why would you want to get along with everyone else? I mean, uh, I think um, get along is in a, I'm using it here in a very liberal way, as in at least we don't kill each other. <laughs> and, we, we, uh, and we are able to exist, to coexist semi like uh, harmoniously and to let each other do our things without trying to come on top of each other to say, hey, you should do it like this. And you need to stop doing that, you know. But that, that's sort of what I'm getting at is that, you know, some, some types, I think they're like, they're, area to develop in often can involve having no interest in interacting with people who are different to them who are not on the same journey as them and for them that's positive that feels to them like they're in flow as a part so, of the journey i get it yeah of course i, I, I just i guess I, I feel like the types are so remarkably different from each other that as soon as we approach it with a sort of a general philosophy of oh this is the good thing to be we we'll sort of have our expectations confounded by that type in terms of what is good for them. Um, and yeah, even something like, you know, you know, a more mature version of this type will be able to get along with someone else. Not necessarily. I think, first of all, it always suggests more alpha delta territory. Extroverted intuition is already being presupposed here. But you want to be interested in exploring other perspectives from different people. And you actually want to have a more harmonized uh, interaction with people with more introvert sensation. What if for you is like these people don't matter and, and, and the less you see them as factoring into your life, the more you yourself will grow. And the more you find people who are more like you, the more you'll grow. And that, that's, I think it's a legitimate thing. It's not what I would like, but I think other people can have that way of thinking and that can be them doing them. I think definitely up to a point, uh, I think that's part of the journey and part of uh, personal growth. But I do think that uh, like over time, uh, as we develop, uh, uh, we start transcending ourselves and our own interests and we start becoming more open and accepting of other people and we allow ourselves our own way. And that's the thing I think society has to learn today. That is, you know, to uh, become uh, uh, strong in yourself and strong enough in yourself that you're not insecure about other people that are different. Uh, but also strong enough in yourself that you can connect with and con collaborate with everyone despite their personalities and have meaningful connections with all personalities 
And I think that's, you know, it's a hard goal. It's certainly a very difficult one. I think, you know, it can take decades before you get to that point, honestly, uh, of hard work. Uh, so, but it's certainly, I think that's where we're talking M destination cognitive function growth, you know, just yeah. lower, learning to know all of them. Uh, what I would say, I think, and, not, and I'm not saying what you're saying is not possible. I think it is possible. But I think it's something which takes converting something, which I still feel we're skewing towards one set of values over another, but making it worth the while of the other types in terms of what they feel is important to participate in that, mm -hmm. to create this more harmonious world. So, for instance, this, this comes back to why extroverted feeling is the role function for, for an ENTJ. It's worth your while to actually be a bit more politically aware of how you're coming across and to not upset people who, who aren't going to be in your personal one-to-one -one, uh, close circle. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a question of, we have the state we want to achieve. And that's one of people getting along of, as it were, being invested in other personality types, being interested in other personality types. And we need to communicate that into a language that people of these other types will appreciate and get on board with. Yeah, I must say, uh... It's uh, been a blast uh, having this discussion with you uh, today. Uh, and uh, I could easily have kept this going for another hour or two. Uh, but I do want to uh, start uh, wrapping it up. But I want to tell oh, everyone, sure. you know, uh, check out uh, uh, Yak's channel. I will link it down below. And uh, let me know your thoughts on the discussion and uh, on the uh, flow state versus socionics and what you think uh, about the two systems and uh yeah do you have any final words yak no i just think we should talk more eric it's been so long so much has happened since we need to discuss the thing is we are coming from such very different sets of assumptions about the types that for us to be i think to be able to increase the number of conversations where we can meet and understand rather than i think this and i think this we need, to, we need to converse a lot more, you and I, yeah. more frequently. We need to do this because I, I De like talking to you. Same, definitely. So uh, thank you again so much for uh, joining in. And uh, yeah, if you want to see Yak on the channel again, <laughs> do leave a comment and uh, like, and uh, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great one. Bye, everyone.